This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi Podcast. I am Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Huntington. And we have a very super awesome special guest today. Tell us who you are and what you do. I am Jordan Grummet, also known as Doc G. I am a personal finance previous blogger, now podcaster, and most recently a book writer. The book I just wrote is called Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. I was going to say, Jordan, you're telling us all the stuff you did and you barely mentioned that you were a doctor. You just mentioned it in the context of the book, but that's a pretty epic accomplishment there. You just kind of brushed it off to the side, I thought. Well, you know, it's funny. As I've gone farther in life, I identify less and less as a physician. One of the big struggles that I talk about a lot in the book and a, a lot as I found out that I had enough money, I was quote unquote, financially independent, and I could do whatever I wanted with my life, I really had to confront this idea that I had built up an identity around myself of being a physician, something I was following in my father's footsteps. He died when I was seven years old. And I got to this midpoint in my career in my 40s, where I realized that this thing that I had been identifying myself with on the outside didn't really match my insides. And so it's no surprise that when you ask me, you know, tell me a little about yourself, it's not something that jumps to the forefront because in this life I'm living now where I kind of do things that I want to do, uh, that just doesn't play as big of a role as it used to. Yeah, I find that fascinating. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But I first met you at the Camp FI Midwest. That is the one in Minnesota. And I heard you have an interesting story about it. Or should I do the sound thing like, let's take a trip down memory lane, like, do 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 You know, that Camp Fi was life-changing for me. And you have to understand, I had just come to the point where I was burning out in medicine. I was at the end of my rope. If I had to sign another chart, if I had to be on call another night, if I had to work another weekend, I read a book by Jim Dolly called The White Coat Investor, which blew my mind and taught me what financial independence is. And I went down the rabbit hole the way everybody does and started reading blogs and listening to podcasts. And one of the blogs I read was a guy named Physician on Fire, who I now know his real name is Leif Dahlin. I actually met him as well as you at this Camp Fire Midwest. I signed up to go because I wanted to meet Leif, the physician on On Fire. But I had also got to this point in medicine where... I knew I wanted to leave, but I didn't yet have that courage to step away from this thing that I had identified myself as my whole life and this connection to my father. It had become my full identity, but that wasn't making me happy. So I made this kind of quick plan. I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to go to this Camp Fire Midwest. I'm going to meet people like me. I'm going to meet this guy, Physician on Fire. And it's going to help me decide what to do with my life. So this was a very open time. And I get there and I start meeting people like you and Leif and JL Collins was there and Gwen Mers, all these people, Tanya Hester, all these people I'm very fond of now that, that, that I feel like I know much better. And I almost got to the point where I was going to weep because I realized for once in life that it was okay that I didn't want to be a physician anymore that indeed I had built up this financial core which was going to support me. And I was surrounded by all these people who were saying, that's great. And it's totally fine to step away from this thing you thought was so important because it doesn't fit you anymore. And it was the first time I felt that courage and inspiration that I could actually do this. Like I could build a life outside of medicine, one that made me much more happy, one that I wasn't going to burn out from. And everything changed from then. Like at the time I walked into that Camp Fi, I was a full-time physician working 56 hours a week, 50 to 60 hours a week, on call nights and weekends, running my own practicing patients in a nursing home, doing all sorts of side hustles like hospice work, just burning the candle at both ends. 
after going to that Camp Fi, I started working on my own life design. And over the next few years, everything changed. I started getting rid of all those things that weren't serving me anymore. I started working less as a physician. I started diving more into personal finance. Eventually, I started a podcast. All of this happened because I was given the courage and permission by going to this Camp Fi, by being surrounded by a community of people who actually fit. I mean, I had been spending my whole life in school, in medical school, in doctor's lounges, in hospitals, and I never felt any sense of connection or community, and I never understood why. And only after going to this Camp Fi did I realize that I was basing my identity on the outside, this thing of being a physician that didn't match my insides. And when I went to the Camp Fi, I started meeting people and all of a sudden I was making friendships and connecting with people in ways that I hadn't ever in my physician community, even though I had known people for years and I would step into this Camp Fi Midwest and all of a sudden I talked to someone for 30 minutes or an hour and I just felt a much deeper connection. So it was a big time in my life and really everything changed based on that trip. That is pretty cool. Did Camp FI pay you to to say this? No, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But yeah. yeah, I think this community is really amazing. One thing that always impresses me is how open people are. Very soon after you meet them, I've had multiple people. What are the things you're not supposed to talk about? Sex, religion, and money. And I've had multiple people tell me about their sex. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> multiple people tell me what their net worth is within like five minutes of meeting them. And some of it's because I, I divulge it myself. I've done that on my blog. But it's strange that someone's like, yeah, here I am. And I've got X amount of money. Like, dude, I, I just met you. But it's pretty cool that they feel comfortable doing that where giving me information that most people would never give after. they Well, they would never give it, not after any years, but ever. Mm -hmm. So. And Jordan, when did you start blogging and what year was uh, the Camp Fi that you're talking about? So I started blogging, I think it was about 2017 and that Camp Fi was 2018. So kind of, I was a newer blogger in many ways in my life when I decided to make a big change, often writing is a big part of it. So I had started this blog as almost like an online diary, a way of kind of saying what I was going through from week to week and eventually day to day because I started writing every day and it became a journal. And the thing I found in this, this, you know, I derived some of that same strength and courage from writing that I did from going to the Camp Fi was by putting things in word and putting them down in the paper. And in my case, because I was writing a blog, I was actually publishing them. I was in a sense holding myself accountable. And by going to this conference and meeting people and telling them about my hopes and dreams, when you take that which is intimate and vulnerable, your hopes and dreams, and you've been holding them inside for so long, and then you kind of let them explode out on page or in person, um, in my case, it made it much more likely that it was going to happen. Like I had to first write it. I had to first talk about it to then start the actions that would start building that kind of lifestyle design, that life I wanted. I want to talk about one more thing at Camp FI. I asked a really stupid question and you gave a really profound answer. I always like to try to probe to ask people deep questions. So I think we we're sitting there one day in the afternoon and I think I asked you like what you wanted out of life or what are your long-term goals or some shit like that? Some stupid stereotypical question. <laughs> and you gave me a five word answer. And do you remember what that was? I think I said something to the extent of, I just want to be. Yeah, that was it. And maybe I took it the wrong way or maybe I'm pulling it up too much, but could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Cause if it's what I think it is, I think it was super cool. I, I certainly can. You know, again, when I came to this Camp Fi, I was at the apex of my career, right? So I had achieved in high school, I achieved in college, I had made it through residency, I had built up a practice. And I found whether it be financial or just goal wise in general, I'd become a little bit of an achievement junkie. In other words, I'd become so focused on the top of the mountain that I often struggled through climbing to each smaller plateau. 
the difference is between process and product. Like I'd become a big fan of product. I want an endpoint, right? I don't care how hard it was. I don't care what it felt like when you were doing it. Where did you end? And I lived a lot of my life that way. And that was part of that huge burnout I had. By the time I got to that Camp Fi, I wanted to start enjoying the process. And I think that's what I really meant by I want to be, which means I want to be in each moment instead of worrying about some kind of end goal. What is this going to get me? Where is it going to lead me? I want to start looking at life such that I enjoy the moments in between. Like I want to enjoy the doing not always what I become at the end, but the process of doing it while it's happening. And I think a big part of fighting burnout and figuring out what my tr true goals in life were was really trying to understand that dichotomy of looking towards achievements and goals because they're meaningful to you and yet not getting so stuck on those achievements and goals that you weren't enjoying the moments of being there in between and getting there or just doing whatever you're doing at the time. Yeah, I think that's such a good message. We have to, well, to back up a second, I think the journey is just as important as the destination. And it might even be more important because the destination is going to be one point in time and then you're going to be looking for the next thing. So if there's anything to uh, well, I have nothing to build on you <laughs> what you say, but I could have <laughs> I wish I would have learned that lesson too to Enjoy the journey because I think oftentimes that's a lot better than the destination. Well, yeah, I've definitely come to the conclusion that probably for me, what true happiness looks like is something in the book I call The Climb. It's making progress towards something that's really meaningful to you, but enjoying the way, right? So I don't feel like you have to get there. And in fact, I often tell my kids, I always say, May you never reach your goals. May you make it only 90% of the way there. And the reason why is there's something beauty and beautiful in striving, and there's something beautiful in that journey. And sometimes being in the journey is a lot more fun than getting to the top. And uh, that's, that's the climb to me. And I'm trying to fill my life with more and more of those climbs that just feel good in the moment. Yes, there is some achievement portion to it. I like to feel like I'm making headway, but Maybe I don't have to make it all the way up to the top. I just feel like I have to make it an inch closer each time. Doug? Yeah, I think you solved the secrets of life. So <laughs> That's it. We're done. Yeah, you spoiled it. It's, it's much too early in the episodes. So we're going to have to keep pressing on here. Um, I, think, I think a lot of us have the same issue where it's like achievement, not that Carl and I were, um, not that we achieved as much as you did. Uh, I think we could both, we could all agree on that, but um, we keep striving and keep like aiming for a goal. And like you said, what, what was the, it was a uh, something junkie. How did you describe it? Oh, I was a definite achievement junkie, or I love to say I was on the achievement <clears throat> treadmill. We talk about the tonic treadmill. I was on the achievement treadmill. I was running faster and faster. And every time I got to one achievement, it made me feel good for about a second or two. And then I was back on that treadmill trying to get to the next one. You kept going. And I'm curious, um, you know, you did accomplish a lot. Did you have any, like, <clears throat> pardon me, did you have any, uh, like, sort of failures along the way? So I feel like my life has been riddled with failures, but I guess never to the extent that they made me look back on life and feel it was bad. So I have a saying, I always say, we tell ourselves the stories about our lives that make it bearable or better yet, magical or mystical. So I can look back at my childhood. I mean, I had a learning disability. It took me forever to catch up to my peers. I, I couldn't read for years. Like I had a special tutor. Like when my friends were opening their book and reading their first reading books, I was coloring in a coloring book because they didn't want to stress me out because I was going to two different tutors during the day to get help. I was horrible at sports. I wanted to play basketball my whole life. I remember we moved schools. So I went from the middle school where I knew everyone to the high school where I knew no one. And I was going to practice basketball all summer so that I could go and make the freshman team so I could be on the basketball team. It was a pretty competitive school, actually. Um, I practiced all summer and then I totally blew it during the tryout and didn't make it. I mean, I failed with girls. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't get a girlfriend for the life of me in high school. I mean, I tried. I asked girls out. They said no. I mean, I, I feel like failure was my constant companion, but again, the story I kind of 
tell myself about my life is that was magical, right? That was kind of the fuel. When you, when you start failing and you realize that the world doesn't end, that life goes on and you still have parents who love you and you still have friends and you still have some good things, like it becomes fuel for trying harder. At least it did for me. It was kind of like, eh, the worst that can happen is I can fail again. Why not throw myself in there? I failed everything I feel like at probably the beginning of my life, but somewhere around college, I started succeeding at more than I was failing at. And like once that lever switched, I felt like all of a sudden I learned how to succeed at stuff. Um, so failure has been a big companion. I failed at businesses. I failed at medical practices. I mean, you know, I am not perfect. I failed at side hustles. I mean, all that's kind of fodder for what's got me here today, but I can't imagine a life in which I didn't try those things. Got it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I know I, I bump into people occasionally that it seems like they haven't failed. They weren't challenged too much. Maybe they were really good in sports. I, I didn't make the basketball team either. I tried very hard. And then, um, it seems like they don't know what to do when they do fail and they give up a little too easy, but you're, you overcame it. And I, I feel like I did that too. I wasn't very good with the ladies either. Carl, how about you? No, I, I was horrible. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of us. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we're doing okay now. <laughs> yeah. We made it through high school. It's tough though. Yeah. Man. Oh, it is uh, very tough. Oh, man. Awkward. And ugh. yeah, I heard a good story once and it was about basketball. Actually, these, uh, I can't remember who these announcers were talking about, but they were talking about a basketball player. And one of them said, well, this particular player is amazing. He's never been like kicked out of a game. He's never had enough fouls to get ejected. And the other guy came in there and said, well, I think that's actually a bad thing because he's not, he's not playing hard enough. If he would have been playing as hard as this other guy, whoever else they were comparing him to, maybe he would have gotten fouled out. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So if you never fail, I think you're – playing it too conservatively and uh, you're missing out. Yeah, I like that. So White Coat Investor was your gateway into sort of fire and being introduced to the community. Can you, uh, I guess, expand on the journey? And so you found the book and then it went from there. So I was lucky. I grew up in a household where great financial stewardship was modeled for me, totally. So my parents had good high paying jobs. They eventually both went into business for themselves. They owned real estate up to 10 or 15 doors at one point during childhood. My stepdad, although he was a CEO of a major company, ended up having a side hustle where he sold pennies online and did this for decades. They spent maybe 50% of what they earned um, between my mom, and my stepdad, five kids, put us all through college, et cetera. So I came at this with a huge amount of privilege. I had great financial modeling. And so I was lucky enough to start doing the same things. Like my wife and I, we started dating, got married, and we just said, okay, we'll save your salary and spend mine. That's just what we did. We took our money and we invested it. When we had an extra, we eventually bought rental properties. I started a, a slew of businesses, most of them that didn't work really well, but my medical practice worked really well and I made a, a lot of money doing that. My problem was that I was doing all these things almost subconsciously, but I didn't have the vocabulary, the knowledge, nor the formulas or the mathematics to understand what it meant. So as I was going farther in medicine, I was getting burned out. I was starting to realize, okay, I can't continue on the way I'm doing things. I started thinking about, well, how am I going to get out of medicine? So I started doing even more side hustles. And I went to my financial advisor. And my financial advisor, you know, he tried his best. He did some Monte Carlo simulations. He plugged all my information into his, his computer work. And he said, oh, you know, I think five, 10 more years of working at the rate you're working now, you should be able to retire. So I kind of put my head down, kept working, but then realized that I was really still unhappy. So I went to my accountant and I asked my accountant, I said, well, how much money do you think I really need to leave, to leave medicine? She was like, $10 million. I'm like, why $10 million? She's like, well, I just think that would be a good buffer. Neither of these people asked me, well, how much do you spend every year? Like, obviously something we in the financial independence community look at very, very closely. So I knew where I was emotionally. I knew how to do the right things to make and invest money. 
but I had no idea to figure out quote unquote what is enough. And and I'm going to say this just to make sure we keep this clear. When I'm talking about enough, I'm talking about enough money because the subject of enough is a big subject we might talk about more later on. But at that point, I had no idea how to even just calculate enough money. So I was writing a medical blog at the time and some guy called my office and my secretary said, there's this guy on the phone. He wants you to take a look at his book and write a review it on your blog. I get on the phone and it's Jim Dolly from the White Coat Investor. I had never heard of him. I had no idea who he was. It was 2014. And so I read his book and that was the beginning of my kind of great awakening. Like I knew immediately, like I figured like, okay, this is how I need to calculate what I need and what I have. And I knew pretty quickly that I was financially independent. What I didn't know is how to deal with that. Because like I say in the book, I was exuberant for about a minute until I realized that I could leave medicine and that thought about leaving medicine caused me a huge amount of panic and anxiety because I didn't know who the heck I was. I didn't know what goals were important to me. I didn't know what my true identity was because I thought it was being a physician, but clearly that wasn't working. I had no idea what a deeper sense of purpose in life was, and I didn't really have a community to support me. So as opposed to it being this great jubilant moment, it was a panicked anxiety ridden moment that lasted months and eventually years where I had to then work through, okay, what does having enough money really mean? Who am I? What do I want to do with this precious life I have? Now that I have a little more control of what activities I use to fill my time, what do I want those activities to be? So it was a process. The actual reading and learning took a few hours. The actual changing my life took much longer as I had to think deeply about who I wanted to be and eventually do things like blog and go to this Camp Fi, which helped me further clarify and move forward. So I, I have a follow-up comment and then a question. I was just talking to Lauren Tang. I assume you've met her, another physician. Yep. I think she practices a rush, but uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, not COVID. It's uh, something else. I think I gave it a dog. He doesn't sound, he sounds a little bit like a frog too, but I think doctors have it the most difficult because you've got the biggest sunk cost, a huge form of sunk cost as far as money and time. But then it's your identity too. When you become a doctor, your name actually changes. You go from MR to DR or from Mrs. to doctor. And I think more than anyone else, doctors are probably more tied to their identity than anything else. So I'm curious it sounds like you have you had a lot of anxiety. Was it the money or just trying to figure out who you really were and who, what your identity really was? What was the person you were supposed to be? So what was the source of your anxiety? So there are minor contributors and major contributors, right? So the minor, very minor contributors are, right, the, the loss aversion of having status, right? So I had status. Like being a doctor gives you a certain amount of status in this world, and that was something that I was thinking of giving up. Um, and even though I didn't need the money, a minor issue was that I had become used to being a high earner. So in a sense, I had identified myself as a guy who can go out there and make a lot of money. And I was talking about walking away from that. And those are two things that, that affected me, but much more minorly. What really caused anxiety was the identity piece of letting go of my father right? Because I had become a physician partly because my dad died when I was seven and he was a prominent oncologist or cancer doctor. And at the time he died, I wanted to be just like him. And so at some point in the mind of a child, I had convinced myself that the only thing that made sense that could explain why this father of three would die all of a sudden out of nowhere, this beloved doctor, the only sense I could make out of it was that it would make concrete in me this idea that I would become a doctor and I would grow up to fill his shoes. And so that caused a lot of anxiety of letting go of that tenuous wisp of connection to a man who had left me, you know, 20 years ago. Um, that was anxiety provoking. The other thing was just not just letting go of the identity of my father, but realizing that this cloak I had worn my whole life of identifying myself as a doctor really didn't reflect my insides very well. And so I felt kind of empty because I wasn't sure who I was supposed to be. I knew that being a doctor didn't feel good anymore. I knew I didn't, didn't identify with the doctor community. I'd never made close doctor friends. 
when I went to parties, I had always shied away from telling anyone what I did because I was kind of ashamed and embarrassed, but I couldn't explain why. The reason why is that that outside wasn't fitting my insides, but all of a sudden, 40 something years old, I had to look at my life and really start asking those tough questions. Who am I and what's important to me? And if I'm not going to say that becoming a doctor and being a doctor is what defines who I am anymore, what then should? And I think that was a very difficult process. Um, you know, I take care of the dying. And I see this often where someone is given a terminal diagnosis and they have this same kind of stress and anxiety and panic comes out because all of a sudden, you know, it's not a question anymore. When am I going to die? Am I going to die? Am I not going to die? All of a sudden, you're given a finite amount of time left and it drops all of those falsehoods and mirages that we've created to protect us and leaves us open and exposed. It's like you no longer have any excuse. You're dying in six months. It's now or never. Who are you? What do you want out of life? And what are you going to do in the next six months? I felt very similar when I found out I was financially independent. It was like I couldn't let that false identity of being a physician stand in the way anymore. It was like, there was no, no excuse anymore. I had to face up to who I was, look myself in the mirror and realize that I can't just let it be easy anymore. Like the easy answer was pretend like being a doctor was fulfilling you and do it for the rest of your life. And while that was easy, it wasn't the right answer for me. And so now I had to, make that turn and start asking the really tough questions. Uh, and that was daunting. It was really daunting to try to like reinvent yourself in your forties. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, so financial independence is, is in a small way, like a little death And I, JD Roth wrote a post and he had a great quote and it went something like, if you really want to find out who you are, if you want to bury your soul naked, uh, throw out, quit your job and throw away your identity. And then you'll eventually learn who you really are. And I thought, that was great, and it reminds me a lot of your situation. But to to build this new self, you had to kill your old self. And I want to add on, like you said, that financial independence, in a sense, is like a death. It is. It's a death of money being the driver of doing what you're doing. And for some people, that's not a big deal because they've never been focused on money in the first place. But for many of us, We've spent so much time and energy trying to figure out how we're either going to make enough money to afford life or make enough money to be happy, or in our case, make enough money to leave these jobs we don't want to do anymore. And so you have to let that concern about money die, or at least let that primacy die and start looking at no, now I have to really think about what, what I want to do with life and who I am and, and what it's about because I, I can't be about making money anymore. Yeah, and I think it's a little bit more than that too. A lot of people are wrapped up in their in their jobs. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other examples. Doctors are the most extreme example, but most people, like if you think about it, if you sleep for eight hours a day, that leaves you 16 waking hours. What does that come out to? 112 waking hours. And if you're like, if you work, excuse me, 50 or 50 hours a week between commuting and a stressful job, that's almost half of your waking hours. And then if you have a spouse and household, most of your time is going to be spent making money. So that's probably, I've heard people say, like coworkers say, I identify more or I'm on better terms with my coworkers than I am with my spouse. I see them more and spend more time with them, which is kind of sad. So if you toss all that away, you better be ready for that or, or have a plan. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I almost think that's okay if two things hold, right? It's fine if you spend all that time doing work, A, if your true meaning and purpose are the work you do, right? So some people are lucky enough, they find a job they love so much that meaning and purpose are fulfilled by doing that work. If that's your case, then that scenario you described is fine. Or the other time that scenario is fine is if the money you are making doing this work, which isn't your meaning or purpose, is then funding your meaning and purpose and allowing you to do those kind of things you really want to do in life. The problem is we're not that intentional most of the time. So we have this vague idea that if we just make enough money, 
we'll get to a point where it solves all problems and then we can start figuring out what's purposeful in life. And my argument is we got to probably start there and then build our financial house around that as opposed to vice versa. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thought, man. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We've completely strayed from what we were going to talk about, but this is great. <laughs> So it sounds like it took a few years to figure things out and you hit this sort of existential crisis. You realize that you were five, maybe for a few years. So can you maybe give us some tips on how you work through the existential crisis and, you know, roughly what if, whatever, like 2014 to 2018 when things started to click, it sounds like. So there's some exercises you can do that really help you try to focus in on purpose and identity. Cause I think that's really the big part of the hard part of this work. The part of this work that I'd encourage people to do way before they've built their financial independence plan. But I didn't have that luxury cause I didn't figure it out till afterwards. So purpose work actually for me was informed a lot by dealing with the dying, right? So I, the work I still do, the only part of my physician's job I've held on to is a very part-time <laughs> work as a hospice physician. And so in dealing with death and dying, the dying have taught me a lot about thinking about our own purpose. And so one of the visualization techniques I like to tell people to do is imagine you're on your deathbed and you're sitting there thinking, I wish... I had had the courage in life to do, to say, to connect with, and whatever comes after that, like there's the dot, 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 right? And whatever comes after the dot, 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 that's kind of your meaning and purpose. And I think we need to start doing these type of exercises when we're far away from death, when we're young, and start trying to figure out what holds meaning and purpose for us. So for me, A lot of that work was trying to say, was thinking about the fact that I'm working with dying people who are given six months left. How are they thinking through what they want to do with those six months? And how can I start doing that now, way before I'm in the same place as they are? So that's kind of purpose work. Then you got to start thinking about identity. And a lot of that identity work, one of the exercises I do in the book is we, you know, we do this process of saying, the sentence I am over and over again and trying to answer it, right? So a lot of times you start with something like I am, and for me, the the immediate answer was I'm a doctor, right? It's what you do for a living. So that's kind of like the first thing that happens. And you realize, okay, well, that's my profession, but it's not really who I am. Then if you kind of go further, you say I am a son, a husband, a father. So now you're describing your relationships, right? That's part of who you are, but it's not really your identity. If you push yourself further, you might go to achievements. I won so-and-so award, right? Or I was top in my class at so-and-so university. Again, achievements are important. But by going through this process and taking some real time and asking yourself, I am, and giving yourself time to think about it, you start coming up with more interesting answers. For me, it eventually became, I am a communicator. Like, I'm a podcaster, a public speaker, a writer. I realized that when I am most myself is when I'm out there having important conversations and communicating with people. But it took me a while of asking that question to really get to the bottom of what I was. So I started working on purpose by asking those important questions that I had started thinking about by dealing with the dying. I'd started going into my own identity. Naturally, this led to more connections as I went to Camp Fi and started meeting with people who had interests similar to mine. And so I started getting this idea that, okay, I had been spending my time as a physician. I now want to spend my time as a communicator so I can write, I can podcast, I can public speak. Well, how am I going to get there from here? I'm this full-time doctor. I've been saving money my whole life. Maybe there's a part of being a doctor that still fits in my identity. How do I kind of do that transition? So for me, the answer was the art of subtraction. Instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, instead of saying, I'm going to stop being a doctor today and never do it again, instead I took a bunch of months to start looking at what I was doing as a doctor and getting rid of everything that wasn't bringing me joy or causing friction in my life, right? So what was causing friction in my life? I hated the paperwork. A lot of the paperwork came with having my own medical practice. So I got rid of my office practice. So then I was just taking care of patients in the nursing homes and 
doing some hospice work, some other things like that. But as time went on, I realized I didn't like the phone calls in the middle of the night and how sick the nursing home patients were. So I got rid of all the nursing home stuff. And then I was doing full-time hospice work, but I didn't want to work full-time and I didn't want to do nights and I didn't want to do weekends. So what I landed on, the part of being a physician that I still connected with was hospice work, but I decided to do it as a contractor. So I wasn't working for anyone. I was working as part of my own business. I contracted out what at the time felt good, which was 10 to 15 hours a week. It helped me make enough money that even though I was financially independent already, I could splurge and take bigger vacations and do more fun things because I was still bringing in some money. But it also allowed me to get rid of everything about being a physician that was causing me stress and anxiety. What I had left over, the hospice work I did, I realized I would do it even if someone wasn't paying me for it. And so that's how I kind of knew that was part of my innate purpose and identity. Work that you're willing to do just because of its innate goodness, not because you're really gaining anything else from it, is work we should hold on to. So I got rid of everything in medicine but the hospice work, which gave me a huge amount of time in my schedule to pursue other things. So I built up my podcast. I started doing more public speaking. And at some point, I sat down to write a book. Um, and so that's kind of how the process went. And it, it, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It took a lot of thoughtfulness. It took a lot of coming to terms with who I am and what's important to me. And then I had to really evaluate how I was spending each day and start getting rid of the things that weren't adding value. That was an excellent answer. I'm curious how it impacted your family and support that you got from your family and that sort of thing. Whatever you're willing to share, I know that's a deeper question. So not only had, had I been attached to this identity of being a physician, but obviously my family was attached to that identity for me, right? So my mother, who had watched me struggle through a learning disability and get into college and then medical school and seen me struggle and been there for all those graduations, um, it was not necessarily easy for her, right? You have a dream for your children, and sometimes that dream changes because the children change. Um, so that there was definitely some stress there, but you know, you balance that with the fact that my family also saw the fact that I was burned out, that I was working too hard, that I wasn't enjoying being a physician anymore, and that the negativity was arising. One of the things I always tell people is. When I first met my wife, I was in medical school and it was at the beginning and this was a very optimistic time in my life. And I was a funny guy. Like I was always laughing. I was always making jokes. I was really, really kind. I was the kind of person who would see a homeless person, run to the store, grab them a sandwich and sit down in the park and eat with them. Like that was the kind of guy I was. Something weird happened. Like I went through medical school and residency and I became cold and angry and not nearly as funny and certainly not nearly as generous, like something about helping people in your nine to five job when you're being paid for it took away from a lot of my generosity out in the world in ways that I had never expected. So my family saw that once I started letting go of work and doing things I wanted to do, the reemergence of that self that I had felt so disconnected from. So I think it was hard for them. It was hard for my wife to say, hey, you're making lots of money. And all of a sudden, you're not going to make as much money anymore. But she also trusted that I knew what was right for me. And even though she wasn't interested in financial independence, she trusted that I understood the math. Um, so I wouldn't say it was 100% easy for any of the people in my life, the transition. But a few years out, they'll all tell you that life looks a lot better. And I certainly am more true to who I kind of started at being before I feel like I kind of got run over by the practice of, of medicine. Um, so, so I think we'd all agree that this ended up being a much better place for me to be at. How long did it take you to trip? By, by the way, we're, we're going to forego the first half. We're still going to talk about the book, but we had some set questions and we'd love to have you on again at some future point, maybe when you're in town. Uh, but how long did it take you to transition to make it from the time, let's say from the time you were at the Campify and you finally felt maybe perhaps you had the permission to transition to your next identity to start feeling good, or did you feel good immediately? Or what, at what point were you walking out in the desert trying to find yourself? Believe it or not, I think most of that walking in the desert was probably from 2014 to 2018, when I had kind of discovered financial independence, but was still working my way through it. 
that Camp Phi was so important to me because it was, you know, by the time I got there, I knew the right answers. I just didn't know how to go from knowing to doing. And I think going to that Camp Phi was that last bit of courage and support that flicked the switch and went from intellectually these last bunch of years you've worked through this, now you're going to actually live it. And so it was a long process of a bunch of years. But once the decision was made, change happened very quickly. So after that Camp Phi, it took me just a few months to really scale back on my medical practice and kind of get to where I wanted to be. Now, granted, it took me time to build up those other things, right? I didn't start writing a book till two years ago. The podcast started after that Camp Phi a few months. Um, I started doing a lot more public speaking a year or two later. So it all kind of grew upon itself. Um, but once change started happening, it happened quickly. Cool. Go ahead. Yeah. Should, should we talk about the book? Do you have anything else on the first part? Doug? Yeah. Uh, one one follow up. You know, you talked about the podcast and you started the podcast shortly after that Camp Fi. At the time, there were plenty of podcasts, plenty of blogs out there. Why did you think you had something to add? Did you have any sort of imposter syndrome or did you know like deep down that like you had some other things you wanted to share? All right. So let me answer. There's a few few questions there. Um, did I think I had something to add? Certainly, there were some fantastic podcasts out there about financial independence, how you got there and what to do. But I felt like there was a space for the 201. Like I felt like we understood the 101 and we had such fantastic resources. But I wanted to start talking about, okay, you figured out how to make some money. Maybe you figured out how to invest it. Now what? Like, what does it look like living your best life once money is not the prime driver? So I felt like that space was open. The other thing is I was working with Paul Thompson. We had just gone to FinCon, which is another big conference. And part of FinCon are these wonderful panels where you show up and there's a panel of four or five experts and they're answering questions or talking about a topic. And so Paul was like, I want to do these panels, but I want to do them in a podcast. So that was also something that wasn't really being done, the kind of multi-guest format. So I knew I wanted to do the 201 and I knew I wanted to do the multi-guest format. And those were two things that weren't really being done much. So I felt like the space was there. The question is, if the space wasn't there, would I still have done it? And I think the answer would be yes, because again, I wanted to start doing things in which I enjoyed the process regardless of the product or, or end goal. So maybe I do a podcast and no one listens, but I enjoy it and it gives me a reason to interview people I really like and gives me a reason to have these really in-depth conversations about things that are on my mind. When that became the goal, because I didn't have to focus on money anymore, I really wanted to focus on my own purpose and identity, the outcomes weren't nearly as important. So as long as I could say, this is a good use of my time, this limited resources that we can't change, but now I don't have to fill that time with making money, should I fill it with podcasting? And the resounding answer was, yes, this feels good and interesting and exciting. The next question, did I have imposter syndrome? Certainly. I mean, my first episode, we interviewed Chad, Coach Carson, Gwen Mers and Bianca Di Valerio about real estate. These were three people who I highly respected, who were amazing content producers. And I was going to babble my way through 40 or 50 minutes of a recording. I remember the moment when we hit record, feeling like I may make the biggest fool of myself in front of these people I totally care about and respect. And then I just dove in. And then I was like, yeah, screw it. Because I mean, what are you going to do, right? Like, and this goes back to those stories about falling on my face as a kid. I mean, I've fallen on my face and I survived and I figured with podcasting, it'd be the same thing. Either I'll do it and be mediocre or horrible. And then I can always reassess later or I'll figure my way through it. And, uh, to this day, it was one of my favorite recordings. Like a lot of people say, oh, don't listen to the first 20 episodes I did as a podcaster because they suck. I don't know. These people were really good. So it was not hard to get them to say kind of cool stuff. Um, but those were some of my joyous moments. And, and uh, I wouldn't trade them for anything, even though I wasn't sure it was going to work out. I certainly didn't think I'd be even close to good at it. Um, but it was one of those things that was just 
such an amazing experience to do it. I can't imagine not trying. Cool. Should we talk about the book? Yeah. Yeah. So Jordan, tell us the name of your book and give us a brief synopsis. So the book is Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. It is pretty much a mixture of my two lives. So I have this one life where I'm a physician and now focus mostly on people and families dealing with dying when they have six months or less. And it was like, I'm doing this profound thing. And then on the other side, I've been writing and podcasting and public speaking about personal finance. And it just hit me that the dying have a lot to teach us about money and life. When you get given a death sentence, when you know you have six months, all of a sudden life becomes very clear. And you know what almost no one says when they find out they're dying? I wish I worked more nights and weekends. No one says, I wish I had hit that net worth of 2.5 million and only hit 2.25. That's just not what what's on their mind. So I started thinking, there's this nurse who does hospice and palliative care named Bronnie Ware. And she wrote this amazing book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. It talks about all the things she learned about what people who are dying regret. And then on the other hand, I had Vicki Robin who wrote Your Money or Your Life, which is this tome about personal finance and financial independence that dictated and told us all the ways we can be better with our money. And I started thinking, well, how do those two concepts mix? And so this book hopefully is a mix of Bronnie Ware and Vicki Robb, and it's what the dying can teach us about money and life. And it intertwines my personal story of losing my father, of burning out in medicine, of learning about financial independence, but also brings in the stories of my patients and what they faced at the end of life and what they learned about it. I would generally organize the book in three sections. The first section is about defining our meaning and purpose. Some of what we've talked about already, this idea that instead of waiting until we have money and are at financial independence to start meaning, to start thinking about meaning and purpose, we should really start thinking about that now. And that's kind of the first section. The second section is the parable of the three brothers and really talks about the different frameworks for getting to financial independence. There is not just one way to get to financial independence. There are lots of ways, but I like to talk about three specifically things like front loading the sacrifice some of what most of us did especially at the beginning of the fire movement which is re really hard at a high paying job save a lot of money put it in the stock market let it compound and then leave as fast as possible that's kind of one path parable of three brothers that's the eldest brother the middle brother is more the side hustler or passive income brother and then the youngest brother is more of the passion play someone who finds a job that they just loves doing and that job happens to create enough wealth for them to cover their monthly needs. In a sense, they're financially independent from the moment they find that great job. So the middle of the book is how we get to financial independence. And then really the last part is to start thinking about what scares you more. Are you afraid that you're going to die today and never enjoy whatever wealth you're accumulated? Or are you afraid that you're going to live to a long life and run out of money? The reason why figuring out which worries you more is it's going to make a difference in how fast you strive towards financial independence. So my father who died at 40 told my mother when he married her that he thought he was going to die young. So for someone like my father, saving 50% of his income made no sense, right? It made sense for him to get life insurance. It made sense to make sure our family was safe. But for him, it made a lot more sense to YOLO. You only live once, like spend money on things you like to do, travel. He loved photography. He loved woodworking. Like he didn't worry much about saving for retirement. He was worried about enjoying the moment. He died at 40 and he lived it up pretty well up until that point. For people like that who think they're going to die young and are worried about not enjoying their wealth, you still want to build a financial independence framework, but you might want to save 10% instead of 50%. Contrast that to someone like me who's always thought I lived to a ripe old age. I'm more worried about running out of money. So you know what? I didn't mind working really hard and grinding it out in my 20s and 30s because I always figured I'd make enough money, I'd let it compound, I'd become financially independent, and then I could have plenty of time when I was older to do whatever I wanted to do. So I think that's really the book in a nutshell. Start thinking about meaning and purpose now, then figure out your financial structure, and lastly, decide the tempo on how fast you're going to get to financial independence by asking that big, important question of, are you afraid you're going to die too soon or live too long? 
Yeah, I've read it and the book was great. One of the things I like about books like this is you mentioned before, you weave a lot of personal stories in there and things you learned, but there's also actionable, good information in there. But I'm going to take a quick side detour and ask you a question. Uh, you are up a magic lamp and a genie pops out and said, hey, Jordan, if you want, I can tell you the date you are going to die. Would you want to know that information? You know, I don't think I would. I don't even want to worry about it. I don't want to think about it. Like, again, I'm at this point where I want to enjoy each day for what it is. And I like striving for certain things. So, you know, I would rather have some of these bigger goals and then still do things every day that bring me joy. And I feel good about that climb, about being on the journey. I think knowing the specific day you die would start putting stress around it such that, yes, it could be clarifying like it is for my hospice patients. But at this point in life, I feel like we can all live like we're dying now. We don't need to know the actual date, right? Because we're dying from the moment we're born. It's a process that's inevitable. The train has left the track and we can't stop it. But we can change how we're experiencing the moment to moment. And so I don't think the actual time or date matters my goal in life was to get to the point where if I found out or if, if, you know, if I had a few seconds and realized I was dying, I'd feel at peace knowing I pretty much accomplished what I wanted to do. I cared for those important people in my life. You know, I did what I wanted to do. And, and I'm kind of getting to that point now. Like, so I don't know if it matters. Like, I'm just going to live every day like it could be my last in a sense by making sure I enjoy what I'm doing and, and doing things that really have a sense of purpose and meaning for me. Uh, this is a two-part question. You can answer either one of these questions or both. What do you hope to accomplish with a book and what do you strive for now? So for the book, I hope to help people. I mean, in the end, I feel like I've been given this amazing vision into life that people don't get because most people don't get to be personal finance podcasters and writers and most people don't get to be hospice doctors. And I think juxtaposing them together has given me this experience that just isn't common. So the hope for the book is I can get it out to as many people as possible who are at this crux in life where they know that money is important, but they're not exactly sure how important they have some inkling of how to get there, but maybe still need some specifics, but also maybe haven't thought much about what that money is going to quote unquote buy them. And so I want people to start thinking about what the money is going to do for them, what this tool is going to help them accomplish. And so that's the goal, that it gets out there, that it helps people, that it enlightens them, that it adds to their life. Um, I think that would be good enough. Now you asked, I think, what do I strive for? Um, you know, I'm, I try and I, I very carefully, like I said, try to build up goals that feel good, that I feel like I can make progress towards and that I can enjoy the progress even if I never get to that ultimate goal. So for instance, for the book, I'd love it to sell millions and millions of copies. I probably don't have a huge amount of control over that. But what I can do is talk about it passionately with people I care about. I can donate as many books as possible. I can try my best to get it out to as many people who need something like this in their life. And I think that's good enough. I, I would say the same for podcasting. I'd love a million people every month to download my podcast. It's probably not likely. And I don't know if I'm really willing to do what that would take because I don't enjoy the work that it would take to get there. But what I can do is try to make a better show each day. What I can do is try to have people on the show that I enjoy interviewing. I can be thankful for each moment that I'm involved doing it. Those are things I can control. So, you know, I have these bigger, more audacious goals, but I try to be careful that meeting them or not meeting them is not nearly as important as the climb that I'm going to be on on the way there. Can you tell us the re release date for the book and uh, any of the other details that make sense here? 
So the book will be available August 2nd. Uh, we're going to push for pre-orders in July. It will be available anywhere online that you buy books. So Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, Target, wherever you buy books online, it will be available there. You can also come to my personal website, which is jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N. G-R-U-M-E-T dot com. I like to send people there because that will send you also to my podcast as well as my personal finance blog, as well as my medical blog, which I don't really write anymore for, but that I wrote for 10 plus years about what it feels like to be a doctor. So all of that is there at jordangrummet.com. The podcast is Earn and Invest, so you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts or go to earnandinvest.com. Cool. Now, we have a couple more questions here. What does your perfect day look like? My perfect day usually has some podcast activities in it, definitely some exercise, and definitely some pleasure reading. Those are pretty much the three things I do consistently, and they're the things I most look forward to above and beyond spending time with family and the kind of more traditional stuff. What, what's your go-to exercise? I love walking. I love walking. I live about a 10 minute walk from Lake Michigan on Northwestern's campus, which is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, campus. And it's one of my favorite places. I can go and walk for miles and miles there. And I try to do that most days. What, what kind of steps do you get per day? Do you know? So I was doing about 20,000 steps a day, but it was hurting me. Like I was starting to have hip and knee problems. So usually about yeah. 15, 15,000. Solid. That's a lot of steps, man. That's yeah. good. Uh, Jordan, and I love that area so much. Whenever I'm in Chicago, I've taken my bike up there multiple times and park it and walk to the Baha'i Temple, which is up there. And ah, oh, so beautiful. Yeah, Northwestern campus is awesome. And then you you said pleasure reading too. Uh, what are you reading right now, or maybe something recently that you were like, this is great. So here's a funny story. Um, I was talking to JL Collins the other day from The Simple Path to Wealth, and he was telling me about an author, Lee Child, um, who writes the Jack Reacher series. Yeah. It's, um, if you guys know what it is, right? It's like Born Identity. It's like the Born books. I've read in the last two months, I think I've read every single Jack Reacher, Lee Child book so much that I'm now on like the spinoff Diane Capri, You oh, Don't Know that. Jack books. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like I get pretty crazy, but I love reading um, and read multiple hours a day every day. And I love pleasure reading. Like I do a lot of personal finance reading for my podcast, um, but I don't like, I wouldn't normally read self-help and that kind of stuff. I love reading just kind of fun pleasure reading. Uh, yeah. So that's that's been taking up my time for the last few months. So I, I'm uh, early on, I'm only on like the third book of the Reacher series, but have oh, you- they're so good. It, I can't, uh, yeah, I can't put them down. So I'm just kind of going through the whole series. Did you watch the Amazon? Um, pretty solid, right? Yeah. So the Amazon, so there's two things on Amazon. There's the Amazon series, which is pretty much a series that covers the first book, which I thought was very solid. There is also a movie, um, that's on Amazon, uh, with, uh, what's his name from Top Gun, um, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. The movie covers, I think it was either the second or third or fourth book. I forgot which one. Uh, it's not as good to me because Tom Cruise isn't the right character, whereas the little. actor yeah. in the series, yeah, the actor in the series is more Jack Reacher. If, so if you read these books, Jack Reacher is six foot five and two hundred fifty pounds. So Tom Cruise, it's hard for him to play a six foot five, two hundred fifty pound guy. Yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll take it offline. We could talk for hours about Jack Reacher, but thanks for <laughs> yes. indulging for yeah. a minute. That was all J.L. Collins. It's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great series. Okay. So we're going to link everything up so people can get to the book. They can get to your podcast, to the website. It'll be fantastic. And potentially we don't want to um, like say this is definitely happening, but you may be coming through Longmont in the future. So people should keep a, a lookout. Is that right, guys? Yeah. So my take is I'm not planning on doing a traditional book tour just because going to the million yeah. cities, et cetera. I'm not going to leave my family for that long. But if I was going to do a book launch party, it would definitely be in Longmont. So there is a possibility. I've been rolling it around in my head for mid-August. We could have a super party there. And it would kind of tie things up a little bit because Leaf is going to be in Longmont for a week in mid-August as well. What? We could discuss that offline. So how cool would that be for you to be there at the same that, time that as him? That would be very cool. Yeah. 
That sounds good. This is a great spot to end. Jordan, it's been amazing. It was great talking to you. It's been wonderful being on the show. Thanks for the thoughtful questions. Yeah, thanks for having us. Or thanks for... <laughs> Jesus. God. It's a blooper reel in the real show. Oh, man. the whole thing up. Carl, Carl's used to me being the host and interviewing him. <laughs> thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast, and I'm Doug Cunnington, the balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five, and uh, actually we don't give high fives in in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week.